Once when he was a young boy, he ran away on a whim. It was dark at night and he was being chased by wild beasts. He had just about given up as he shook in fear, wondering if this was how he was going to die. When he noticed the beast had stopped chasing him and there was a huge shadow behind him, he turned to find the white dragon looking down at him as if to say, Worry not, I've got your back. That was his first and only encounter with a dragon said to be protecting the Etretat Empire. The dragon's backing was the reason the Empire ruled the continent, because who wants to fight a dragon? This encounter was one he would remember for life, but his encounter with the dragon wasn't the only thing that made that day unforgettable. He had returned home after being rescued by the dragon, expecting that his disappearance would not be noticed since the day was yet to break. His expectations shattered before his eyes as he was met with his home up in flames. No matter what the servants did, be it pouring water or death, the fire showed no signs of winding down. They sought even the aid of magicians, but all he could do was watch as the fire relentlessly swallowed up everything he held dear, only perishing after its mission was accomplished. The cause of the fire was never determined, and without knowing the reason for his family's demise, the young boy was left alone. In that dark pit, with no idea what to do or how to do it, he was extended two hands. The hand of the heiress of the Orleans family, Miss Evelyn, and the hand of the current emperor and then second prince. One sought to help with no strings and the other asked for his devotion, offering a strong backing. All he had was his talent to the sword and a title that was being vigorously sought after by his relatives. If he intended to keep even the meager positions left with him, he had no reason to refuse the help he was being offered. He protected his family name with the help of the Orleans family, learning all there was too about inheriting his father's assets and being the head of a family. And with the prince's backing, he was able to protect himself from the wagging tongues of the nobility. He went on to become the youngest duke in charge of a dukedom, as well as a grandmaster, Duke Carl Chester. This was the result of his sweat and tears. He earned his place with gritted teeth. But not long after, a stroke of misfortune met him and the empire. The carriage housing the emperor and the first prince was met with an accident. Opinions varied as to the cause of the accident. Some thought it was intentionally carried out with malice and the others were not so sure. Although they debated over the different views, what they could all agree on was that the Empire could not afford to show any weaknesses. As if they were running out of time, they rushed to put the second prince on the throne. It could have been how they rushed to crown him or something else, but the new Emperor must have been anxious, unsure of who to trust because he summoned Chester. He wanted Chester to devote himself to him, to become the sword that protects him. As someone he extended a hand to when in need, and as someone he has known for a while, he was the only one he could trust. That was his first order from the Emperor, who had just ascended the throne. Now in the present, years later, the day of the Emperor's banquet. The nobles networked or gossiped depending on your point of view. They wondered if the dragon's proxy would be attending the banquet. The proxy was the dragon's means to keep watch on the Imperial family. After all, they only thrived by his backing. Addition out his power came with the responsibility to ensure the people didn't suffer by the ruler he approved of. The proxy was the start of the only bloodline that could keep the Imperials in check. The Orleans Dukedom was that bloodline. Although the young Miss Orleans rarely showed up, the Emperor had personally invited her this time, so they awaited her arrival. Chester, upon hearing them mention her throes, he had thought she would not show up since she deemed such events too troublesome. But seeing as the Emperor had personally invited her, it didn't seem like it could be avoided. He was anxious. He had important information to pass on to her, preferably before the Emperor arrived. Just as he was thinking that, she arrived, immediately drawing the attention of all. As is their nature, they began to whisper. Some thought she only attended because Chester was there too, not because of the Emperor. Others thought she might not be human since she was the Dragon's proxy. Unfazed, she went on to greet other noble families, actually networking, unlike the rest of them. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see Chester nodding at her anxiously. She figured he had something important to say, deciding to go see him once she was done speaking to some nobles. When she could finally extricate herself from the nobles, she sought after Chester, who had been waiting for her on the terrace. The thought of him waiting for her excited her a little. Using her fan to hide that, she apologized for being late. She asked what worried him so listening as he recounted his meeting with the emperor before the banquet. The emperor had seemed a little strange. He had called Chester by all his titles. The master of the Marquis Chester household, the head knight of the first order, his loyal subject. It was almost like a warning. 
Like, these are your responsibilities. You're not gonna defy me, right? Chester was, after all, his loyal dog. Then he asked the question with the scariest innocent smile he could muster, if he would be able to hand him the head of the dragon. Although he was loyal to the emperor, he had a responsibility to the people too. Chester was uncomfortable with the idea of even attempting to go after the dragon that had been keeping the empire safe. The emperor passed his absurd proposal off as a joke, but that joke had left Chester unsettled and he had sought to inform the duchess as the proxy to the dragon. The duchess figured the kid, kid being the emperor, yes, had finally lost his mind, otherwise he wouldn't let his loose tongue run. Carl figured it could have been one of his whims, but he wanted to tell her in case there was something amiss after all. Evelyn found his worried expression cute. That's not, that's not what's going on right here. Can you be focused? What could have been his first order as head of knights if it wasn't brushed off as a joke was the assassination of the Empire's guardian? All Evelyn could see in his future was stress. She offered to take him on vacation to a villa in the Diblan region instead. Chester, oblivious to what I can already see, did not understand her train of thought and reminded her that her aid awaited her outside. There's plenty of work to do, let's not go skipping on our responsibilities, I agree with you on that too. That wasn't a welcome reminder for Evelyn though. Narrowing her eyes, she took a step, closing the distance, taking his chin in her hand. Yes, mommy. He was cute 99% of the time, but moments when his obliviousness showed he was a little less cute. The sudden closeness made Chester flustered. Obviously, he has feelings for her, but okay. If I saw that face a lot from childhood, I, I, I would too. It's understandable. His reaction raising his cuteness back to 100%. It was cute again. They had been on the terrace for a while now and that could make the gossipy nobles raise their eyes. Evelyn told Carl to head inside, not relenting even when he cutely offered for her to go first since the night was cold. He reluctantly left her on the terrace. Imagining how a vacation with the Duchess would feel, he rejoined the socialites in the ballroom. Seconds into his first conversation, the terrace the Duchess had been on went up in flames. Carl, rooted in his spot, took a couple seconds to register that the Duchess was just on that balcony. The Duchess was just on that balcony. Chester spearheaded the investigation into the incident, choosing to directly involve himself as opposed to receiving reports. It should have been him, not her. He should have stayed back on the balcony instead. Midway through his regrets, he was informed by his aide that the explosion appeared to have been caused by magic. The fire could not be put out by water, but more importantly, it did not spread outside the terrace it began. By daybreak, the fire disappeared like it was never there, as if its only purpose was to destroy one thing in particular and then smother itself out. This piece of information triggered a memory he hadn't dared to forget. How he lost everything he held dear. As he lost himself in those memories, he was snapped back to reality by his aide calling out to him to inform him that he had been summoned by the Emperor. Arriving at the Emperor's office, he had thought he would want to report and proceeded to start filling him in, but was cut short. According to the Emperor, he found what had happened to Duchess Orleans to be regrettable, but more importantly, for it to have happened at the Emperor's banquet must have been an act of terrorism, if you say so. However, due to Chester's ties with the Duchess, he figured it would be unfair to leave this to him. After all, he must be in pain after losing someone he's known for a very long time. He had decided to take this case up himself as an act of kindness towards his loyal dog. Chester wasn't convinced this was the best course of action, but the Emperor left no room for discussion. He all but sent him home against his protests. Chester, defeated and suspicious, headed home deep in thought. On the way home, a weird guy that looks like the spy version of Sherlock Holmes informs him that he needed to get ready soon, but Chester wasn't in the mood to do anything. He had just lost Evelyn. The spy-like man understood and hopped off the moving carriage. Why? Could you not tell them to pack for you? Please pack, let me calm down. No. As he went on on his journey, Carl spotted a light in the forest. A light that could mean the chance to see something he thought he'd never see again. He shouted for the carriage to be stopped, running off ignoring calls for him. He ran towards the light like his life depended on it. Arriving breathless, there he was, the dragon that had saved him. But that dragon that had saved him years ago, transformed into the supposed dragon's proxy, Evelyn. Evelyn was alive. Just as she landed, she caught him out of the corner of her eyes and their eyes met. <laughs> she had been discovered but remained unbothered. It was after all Carl. Carl could hardly believe what he was saying. Forget the dragon. She was alive. There was much to talk about and Evelyn wasn't shying away from the conversation. She introduced herself for the second time as the head of the Orleans household and the current dragon lord protecting the emperor, Evelyn Orleans. 
Even though it might have been hard to accept this new truth, he had seen it with his eyes. Evelyn apologized for scaring him, taking his hands in hers and requesting they sit and have a proper conversation. She had to work more than usual thanks to the bombing and she was feeling a little tired. Chester offered to find him a spot to sit. Now sitting, she explained that she only survived because she's a dragon. Since the recovery is slow in her human form, she had to revert for a while into her dragon form, taking shelter in the forest. She hadn't expected to run into Carl mid-transformation. He offered apologies for acting rashly but was shut down. As far as Evelyn was concerned, he had no fault. And as a matter of fact, if anyone was to blame, it would probably have to be her, more specifically her carelessness. She was opening up and he was listening. She stated she was in the middle of a game that had been running for 13 years. A game that started when she met him in the forest. Aww. <laughs> Telling us your love story. It dawned on Carl that the sponsorship he received out of nowhere was from the dragon who had saved him. She went on to explain that the forest wasn't one that could be entered by anyone not of the bloodline the dragon had permitted. Even though time had passed and the existence of the forest had been forgotten, the forest still stood as the lair that protected the empire. For the first time in hundreds of years, a human ventured into her forest, a human she was interested in. Thanks to him, she had awoken from a long, dull slumber. But to her dismay, this human that had caught her interest had bugs around him. Bugs that didn't know to be afraid of fire. At that moment, she magically immobilizes an assassin and ear shot away, startling Carl because he hadn't noticed anyone around. Upon examining the intruder, he found that he was one of the emperors. He bore his crest. Evelyn figured Chester must have been out of it because of her, a slightly welcome thought, when he rushed into the forest since he usually took care of his tails. Since the forest was not visible to others, the assassin must have slipped in with Carl as he raced in. Evelyn offered that they join forces to take care of the bugs. After all, doing it on his own would have been a boring experience. He however understood what having the Emperor's goons telling him meant, and he didn't want to involve her in the fight. Good for you. His unwelcome response saddening her. She had no problem fighting by his side. Hell, she would have enjoyed it. He wasn't going to change his mind, so Evelyn decided they should head back to his together. <laughs> she couldn't head back home because there would be eyes on the lookout for her. Her only other option to seek refuge in his house. She took his hand, asking if he would be okay, sending his cheeks into blush town. He was more than ready to let her. Even if he hadn't had an extra room, he would have created one. It was for her, after all. He offered to escort her personally with his carriage, only stopping for a moment to ask what they should do with the dead guy. Evelyn said they didn't need to worry about him. Once they leave, he would become one with the forest. Not a single part of him would be left. She turned to navigate their way out the forest, leaving Carl to trail behind. In the palace audience room, the emperor, after being informed by a shadow that they had lost contact with one of the shadows chasing after Carl, surmised that Evelyn must still be alive. Because Carl would never kill one of the emperor's boons. If you doubted if it was sus till this point, ditch your doubts. Just ditch them. Smile is creepy. He's probably already figured out she's not a normal human being. Because why else would you be sure that somebody that was obliterated with magic flames still alive and breathing? Moving on. Back at home, Carl, who just got out of the shower, dripping on slightly sexy, is informed the Duchess wished to see him before he went on with his day. The thought of seeing the Duchess first thing in the morning causing his heart to skip several bits. As he got ready to meet her, his butler rattled on his shadow and ear shot away, trailing after him as he walked towards her room, ensuring he looked more than presentable, up until the point he stopped to take a deep breath in an attempt to clear his nervousness before venturing into her room. The Duchess, who had been drinking tea in anticipation of his arrival, smiled when he called out to her from outside her door. <laughs> He respectfully sat in front of her, his hands holding onto his thighs, possibly to prevent them from vigorously shaking out of nervousness. She threw him off guard, asking that they drop the formalities since they were to be living under the same roof. He had been calling her Duchess up to this point. She wanted to hear him call her name. If this was too much for him, he was welcome to act like he didn't know her, take it or leave it, sir. Although her request was out of his comfort zone, the latter was simply an unbearable suggestion. They had actual business to discuss, but she refused to carry on if he didn't drop the formalities. She was leaving him no way out, so he could only succumb to her wishes. Calling out her name was intimate enough to severely embarrass him. Now that they had that out of the way, they could talk properly. She figured that since she got rid of the Emperor's informant, he was now aware she was still alive. Carl would need to continue investigating the incident. 
She was interested in how the brat actually pulled off the assassination attempt, but more than that, he could not let the emperor know she was with him, otherwise he was bound to receive backlash. Him wanting to kill her was one thing, there was no need to put Carl on his radar too. Just as they concluded their conversation, the butler informed Chester it was time for him to head to work. As Chester moved to leave, Evelyn told him she had casted illusion magic across the mansion the night before, so no news of her existence in his mansion would seep out. She told him he could go to work without worrying and she'd return safely. Come home safe, dear. <laughs> Something you'd hear from a significant other sending you off to work. Carl didn't miss out on that either. It was a warm feeling. He promised to be back soon and went off to continue his day. She might not have seen him blushing, or maybe she did, but their thoughts were operating on the same wavelength because his sudden absence had her thinking that she might as well go through a binder summer home in the deep land region. Hmm, yes, I like it when I get to live in the same room as you. <laughs> Reading the progress reports of the investigation into the incident, Carl learns that the incident was a result of black magic, which isn't well researched. He recalled hearing there was a book of magic in the Queen's palace. Not everyone is permitted entry, so he offered to go himself. After all, this case involved someone who had been looking after him. He wanted to know he had done his best, enough to hold his head up high. Leaving the training of the first other knights to his aid, he heads for the Queen's palace. As he reads through the magic book in the library, the shady guy from the night before shadily meets up with him again. He informs him that the process for whatever shady business they have going on will be faster than they originally thought, thanks to the help of a new assistant. The day was drawing near. When he tries to probe into the identity of the assistant, Shady Guy shuts him down by telling him he doesn't have the authority to give him that information. But he could tell him that the one, quote unquote, had said it was someone he could trust. Since the one had said so, he figured there was nothing for him to worry about. Shady Guy told him to continue preparing for battle and was about to tell him something else before they were interrupted by the sound of someone coming in. It was the librarian coming to check on Chester. Chester claimed to need his help, figuring that the shady guy would have left already. Meanwhile, shady guy that we can now see is young and handsome. Mm -hmm. Looks on into the library from a tree branch. Everything was moving in accordance with the will of the one. Sorry. Back at the palace, the emperor is beyond frustrated not being able to find any traces of evidence magic. He definitely knows she's a dragon, because that's what all this goddamn fuss is about. The thought of his loyal dog being favored by the duchess did not sit well with him at all. He decided he was going to bait the dragon, sending the maid off to inform the prime minister he was going to hold a hunting competition in late spring. He figured if he kept Carl by his side during the competition, he could use him as bait to lure out bigger fish. Might even catch himself a dragon protecting an empire. For someone that governs an empire, you don't seem to care about what angering a dragon would do to your people, sir. Why do you want to catch a dragon? Meanwhile. Things in the Empire weren't all games and food for the common folk. The ground appeared to be drying up almost like a drought was coming. They figured the incident leading to the death of Duchess Orleans had enraged the dragon and now he was withdrawing his protection from the Empire. Their negative emotions directed at the Imperial family for failing to protect her. Carl, who was out investigating with his aide, heard one of those such remarks. The rumours would have been uncertain for those who were supposed to have ensured the safety of the Emperor's banquets. While Chester validated the emotions of his aide, he reminded him that only blaming himself would solve the case, and if anyone was to be blamed, he would take the brunt of it. He was the one who left her alone at the balcony where the incident took place. With the hunting competition around the corner, they would have little time to investigate. They needed to fan out and focus on the case. Black wasn't sure what Evelyn was planning, but he figured she did in fact have a plan. After another hard long day at work, he heads home and is welcomed by a waiting Evelyn. It wasn't the first time he had been home late in the last couple of days. She figured he was now extremely busy. He explained that the Emperor had decided to hold a hunting competition so he was bound to be busy for a while unfortunately. She could see right through the Emperor's intention. It irritated her. It irritates me too, sis. Putting that aside, the shadow that had been cast on Chester's face since he heard the rumors in town was more worrying to Evelyn. She had heard the rumors, so she knew what was on his mind. She decided to give him a little background on her and the Empire. Since she had been protecting the Empire, everything that grew in it was born from her power. And long before she was there, there were people who lived while cultivating this barren land. Those people's bloodline didn't disappear. It continued on. She's not one to be nonchalant about those under her protection. She would not thoughtlessly withdraw her powers. 
He felt slightly guilty for making her come out to say that herself. He knew she had a plan, even if he had not been told of it. He professed his belief in her. It was almost like a pledge which made it all the more cute. Since it was late and he would have been tired, Evelyn bid Carl goodnight, giving him a smile that he couldn't help but blush after seeing. He watched her walk to her room before staring out into the sky. The day the shady character had been talking about was no longer far away. Time passed and it was the time of the hunting competition. You all like finesse too much. Anyways, with the arrival of the Imperial Hawk, the Emperor in high spirits signaled the start of the hunting competition. While the Emperor stood in the middle with Carl handing him his horse, the nobles gossiped in whispers. Why don't you ever gossip with your full chest? Nobody could understand why the Emperor was holding a hunting competition. It wasn't to curb the influx of monsters because knights had been sent out for that already. No one could fathom the thought process of such a supposedly dignified being. Dignified my ass. The Emperor asked that Carl be his escort for the duration of the competition. As the loyal subject he is, Carl was more than ready to. They headed out on their journey to win. Now relatively alone as they rode their horses, the Emperor couldn't help but let his inferiority complex show. He pointed out that the nobles seemed sure that they, the Emperor and Carl, would be winning this competition. As someone trained in the Imperial language, because all their words are double-edged for no reason, Carl added that they definitely thought of the Emperor's renowned archery skills when they said that. The Emperor didn't agree and accused, yes, accused, Carl of being humble to a fault. Chester noticed they were going deeper into the forest and deeming it unsafe alerted the Emperor to the fact. The Emperor brushed off his worries, saying it was an area he was used to and he wanted to enjoy his hunts for the first time in a while. Shady. Seeing his first animal prey, he moved to shoot it down, recounting that Chester did not like hunting. Heading to pick up the incapacitated animal, Chester admitted to disliking the indiscriminate killing. As he bent to check on the animal, the Emperor complimented his consistently honourable character, following him down an obviously suspicious road without deviating even in the slightest. He was the most naive dog the Emperor had seen. Chester turned to see the Emperor pointing his bow at him ready to shoot. He claimed to like Carl but found himself at the end of his wits with Evelyn the dragon. Just as he thought fondly of Carl, the dragon probably did the same. So Carl was the bait. The rustling of the trees alerted the Emperor to the arrival of his shadows. Or so he expected. Instead, he heard something hard drop behind him. Turning slightly to find what should have been his shadow coming to his aid lying lifeless. He didn't know what could possibly have gone wrong. The answer slowly standing up in front of him. The mask of the loyal dog fully shattered. The emperor had called him a naive dog. To get that naive dog, he had brutally burnt and destroyed an entire family. Carl didn't believe the emperor actually thought he'd remain ignorant of his parents' murderer his whole life and loyally wag his tail at him forever. The Emperor's backup had failed and the tables had turned. He could see his way out was non-existent. Carl walked over to him with purpose. He had kept quiet for a long time nursing his pain. The person before him was not an Emperor he revered, but the criminal responsible for the death of the previous Emperor and the first Prince, and the death of his parents. Dropping formalities, the person before him was a criminal, and the second Prince, Theodore Ferdinante. He knew he was at the end of his rope, but as all living things do in the face of destruction, he struggled. He called Carl crazy for even attempting to pin such a crime on him. If Carl apologized, he was willing to forgive him. A proposal that didn't shake Carl in the slightest. Theodore was losing his mind. Carl had to bow to him. There was nobody who could be the emperor other than him. Words weren't getting through to Theodore. So Carl took a page out of the Duchess's book and did a second introduction. He wasn't the head knight of the first order of the current emperor, but instead the head knight of the direct order of imperial prince Reinhardt, Carl Chester. As if on cue, a group of knights walked in with the imperial prince at the forefront. If Theodore thought he was losing his mind before, this new revelation made it clear that that was just the beginning for him. What was a dead man doing participating in their conversation? He was sure he was in a bad dream. A ridiculous claim after the nightmare he has put us through, but okay. There was no way he was talking to a dead man. He raced off on his horse. A rather anticlimactic move for someone who's shamelessly killed a few people in his pursuit for power, but will ignore that. The Imperial Prince, as disappointed as I am, or even more so, bent to pick up the bow and arrow Theodore had intended to use on Carl, targeting the limbs of the horse and effectively having him thrown off. 
He pathetically crawled on the floor, and the imperial prince stood before him. It was time to school his little brother. His dear brother had changed so much within the time they were apart. He couldn't recall him being this stupid in the past. I mean, if he did indeed kill the emperor and the prince, he could not have been this stupid, I agree with you. He wondered if he got complacent being the only one of real blood alive. Reinhardt had a little to say to the pathetic ex-emperor. As he lived in the shadows, he hadn't missed out on any news relating to his dear brother. His brother, who had been so scared of losing the position he had schemed so hard for, because the dragon didn't approve of him as the next monarch, and so he tried to kill her. The dragon. He tried to kill a dragon. It really was a testament to how smart he had become over the years. But he hadn't dealt the final blow. He asked Theodore if he didn't think all the nobles consolidating and quickly put him on the throne was wed for a stroke of luck. Theodore hadn't thought it strange. He assumed it was to prevent the invasion of foreign countries. But then it hit him. He recalled the night he had sought out Evelyn, back when he still thought she was just a proxy. She had revealed that contrary to popular belief, she was the dragon, and this dragon did not approve of him becoming monarch. What he had forgotten all those years ago in the chaos and rushed appointment was that the nobles would never accept a monarch the dragon had not approved of. They only crowned him to give Reinhard time to prepare for his return. That was quite the effective finishing because Theodore's already fragile mental state was completely shattered. To him, the throne was his. The royal cloak was his. But nobody seemed to agree with him on that. He cried out in confusion and pain. The victim complex much? He didn't seem to quite understand the position he was in. So Reinhardt knelt to make it clear to him. If Reinhardt was not averse to the idea of letting him off with such an easy death, he would have cut his head where he stood. But he had to pay for the pain he and their father went through and the pain he cost Carl. He had said all he wanted to say. Turning his back on his brother and now criminal, he asked that he be dragged away. Theodore continued to wail as he was dragged off. He was a bloody emperor and they were required to listen to him. Carl looked unfazed as his former boss and arch enemy was hauled away. Compared to the time they had put in to actually catch him, his arrest was rather swift. When Prince Reinhardt asked Carl if he didn't feel it was futile, he couldn't answer. He hadn't decided yet. The prince thanked Carl for his help up to this point and decided now that the show was over, it would be okay to tell Carl who the assistant he had been curious of was. The person who had helped pressure Theo, yes, we're calling him Theo, and poked holes in his armor, the assistant that made Carl's life just a little easier, was none other than the dragon lord of the empire, Duchess Orleans. She explained to a baffled Carl that since he had rejected her offer to help him, she decided to do so secretly. While her go-to solution would have been to completely go crazy at her attempted murder, she figured Carl wouldn't have been a fan of that idea, so she persevered. She was open to treats for being well-behaved. They were in their own world, forgetting the presence of the prince almost completely. A new wave of worry hit Carl. He asked if it was okay for her to reveal her identity in this manner. Him worrying about her and him smile. But he didn't need to worry much. Her identity not being known was a matter of convenience, not necessity. Evelyn, however, wanted to make something else clear before they moved on. After witnessing how Theodore had used Carl through his life under the shadow of support after his parents' death, and recently, as bait, she couldn't bear to be put in the same box. She told Carl her interest and aid was not to use him. She simply liked him. That was all there was to it. And there's our confession, ladies and gentlemen. The confession broke Chester. He could neither think nor talk straight fumbling his words as he sought to ensure what he thought he heard was indeed what she said, something he did often and she found cute as always. Good for you. Reinhard took the opportunity to remind them in their own little world that he was, in fact, still present. While Chester, the loyal subject he is, was insistent that his presence never fizzled <laughs> Evelyn wasn't budget. She reminded the prince that he had made a promise to her earlier and hoped he wasn't about to feign ignorance. The prince insisted he hadn't forgotten and was willing to keep the promise right now if she so desired. Music to her ears, she took Chester's hand, ready to go, but Chester's sense of responsibility did not allow him to follow her immediately. The after all hadn't finished up at the hunting competition, and there was sure to be a lot to do with the emperor being arrested and all. The prince informed him that the favor was for his vacation, so he could leave without feeling burdened, and his replacements had arrived. Evelyn assured him that there was 
absolutely no reason yet present he could not live with her immediately. He couldn't believe his ears as he stared blankly at Evelyn. But he did know one thing. He could never say no to her. Both her and her inner dragon agreed it was time for them to be alone after hearing that. She dragged him along eager to get started on their vacation. When he asked where they were heading so he could prepare accordingly, he was met with a mischievous smile and knew that everything had been taken care of. I'm gonna take care of you baby, all you gotta do is show up. <laughs> they were heading for a summer home in Dibland region as they had discussed the night of the banquet. Chester had figured she was joking but Evelyn proudly announced that she has always been honest with him. Every word he had brushed off because he thought she probably didn't like him that way was said in honesty and sincerity. Bum dropped, face flushed, mission accomplished. Touching ground on serious matters, she asked if he was really satisfied having his long revenge end so fruitlessly. There was no satisfaction to be had in Theodore's suffering. He thought for a while and recounted that his mother often told him not to dwell on the past. If you did, you'd end up missing out on what really matters. So for him, yes, this much was enough. Instead of staying confined to the miseries of his past, he'd rather follow the one who is precious to him right now in the moment. That revelation deserved a second to process for the dragon. She, after all, hadn't expected a reply to her confession on the same day, much less in the same hour. Seeing he was a man who held no regrets, she wanted to be a woman who held none too. Caving into her impulse she'd been denying for years, she leaned in, giving him a peck. She must have missed the lips, but that's okay. This is good too. However, that was way too much physical contact for Chester. The contact had him scoring back in full force. Now she was free from regrets, they could embark on their summer vacation free of worries. She excitedly walks off. Chester, who had regained his composure, chasing after her. And that brings us to the end of this lovely and short story. I hope you enjoyed the recap. See you next time. Thank you.